Sincere apologies for starting five minutes behind schedule. Let's begin. Corruption has for long been one of Sub-Saharan Africa's greatest challenges. In the last Corruption Perception Index by Transparency International, Sub-Saharan Africa had an average score of 33. West African countries have had missed stories of corruption in the last 10 years, with countries like Nigeria and Liberia dipping, while nations like Senegal and Ivory Coast are relatively improving. Political instability has for long also been an issue, as many countries have battled with the subject of public graft by their leaders. Many nations have set up bodies to fight corruption, a daunting fight indeed, in the face of deep institutional decay. Today on Village Square Africa, we'll be looking at how corruption is being addressed in West Africa. I am Felicity Ezewike, holding the fort for Sulaiman Alede. A very warm welcome. We'll start after this break. West African nations are battling against the institutionalization of corruption. Perennial elections see politicians campaign to wipe corruption out of the polity, but they soon become agents of what they preach against. Nigeria is the, in the last Transparency International Corruption Perception Index, scored 24 points, its lowest ever. Mali and Liberia scored 29 points each and many more are dealing with serious corruption problems. Organizations like the National Anti-Corruption Institutions in West Africa, NASIWA, have seen the different anti-corruption bodies come together to find an end to the scourge, but the problem is hardly beaten. In the discuss around corruption, not much attention seems to be paid to nations whose efforts are showing real progress. Senegal and Ivory Coast have sustained their fight against corruption and have enjoyed a stable economy for some time. Who should drive this fight against corruption? Is it the people who are victims of this problem or the government where it's being driven? What are the roles of the agencies and the civil societies of West African nations in this important discuss? For this conversation, I have as guests two gentlemen, Dr. Tunji Oguyemi, Senior Lecturer in Economic History at the Obafemi Awolowo University, Leife, Nigeria. We also have Francis Benkaifala, the Commissioner, Anti-Corruption Commission of the Republic of Sierra Leone. Welcome to VSA, gentlemen. Thank you. I'll start with you, um, Mr. Kaifala. Thank you. From the government to the people corruption seems to be tickling down really it, it's it's like it's becoming a general thing how did it become so bad what fuels this trajectory i mean at some point we're talking about um the government now we're talking about the people i think two things are primarily responsible for the level of corruption uh firstly our culture transitioning from colonialism to Western democratic kind of government in the various countries, the cultures that we had, the idea of corruption that we have now, particularly for leadership, is almost foreign. So the idea of public sector corruption, for example, in my country in Sierra Leone, the paramount chief owns the land, the property, the people, and the women. So he can do whatever he wants to do with it. So even bringing the idea of corruption to that institution is, is something which we had to grapple with. So leadership came from this kind of system and that leadership felt like it had to benefit the same way as chiefs used to benefit in pre-colonial days. They own the resources, they own the people, they own the land, they can do whatever they want to do with it. That culture, of leadership having a right to, to take and live a life that is, that even though the rest of the population may be in poverty, is the primary reason why we have been battling with corruption in generally in Africa. Secondly, and most importantly, 
also there has always been a culture of impunity. For example, in my country, there used to be a president who used to say, Shaka Stevens, he was the longest serving president ever. And he used to say, where you tie a cow, that is where it will eat. Where you tie a cow, that is where you will eat. Will eat. So it's basically giving a free for all right for people in offices to be able to, to benefit whether improperly or properly from the resources of the country. So impurity drives the level of corruption that has been there. And of course, institutional institutions that fight corruption are more recent. The, the most recent, I mean, it's they are the production of the late 90s and the early 2000s coming up to the 2020s. So um, you can see why Africa has is really late to deal with this idea of corruption, but also historically, um, it is even more foreign than we think. I want to put the same question to uh, Dr. Ogunyemi. Uh, he talked about the institutional part of it. I want you to speak on, you know, the people are now seeming to be part of this corruption that we're talking about. How did we get to this point? Do you have something to add to what he has said? Okay, um, I think I will stay with you, uh, Mr. Kaifala. Um, let's go to the Pandora's paper. We know that um, when that um, investigative report came out, a lot of uh, businessmen, African, West African businessmen and politicians' name were out in that uh, report. So the question I want to find out your response would be, how would actions against these individuals be possible, considering that they are, in fact, the drivers of the Say fight against corruption. Uh, the, the, the challenge we have with the Pandora's papers is it is not always talking about corruption. It is a whistleblower, and whistleblowing has various uh, purposes. It may be about wastefulness, it may just draw attention to an unfair way some leaders are benefiting and others are not. It may also be about some shady businesses. Um, that do not necessarily fall within the definition of public sector corruption, which is mostly what we deal with. So, for example, somebody may, may own a business, a legitimate business, and is making profit out of that business, but that profit is killing the people. It may not be corruption because he may not be taking money, resources, men to make their life better. It's just that he may be engaging in some business that is profiteering, while the rest of the country is poor. So the Pandora's Papers really bundles everything together and puts it out there. Uh, just like the Panama Papers and other papers, and names are dropped here and there. So it is really difficult for you to be able to identify a particular one that says this is corruption. Uh, even where you can identify, it may not necessarily fall within the framework of public sector corruption that institutions like the EFCC or the ICPC or the ACC in Sierra Leone or Liberia or Tanzania may be dealing with. So... Um, that may be the reason why really we have not seen traction on, on work being done on the Pandora's paper. In Sierra Leone, where I come from, nobody was named in the Pandora's paper. So we have not really dealt with this much. Um, but, and, but I have not really had much being done by countries where uh, people were named. But the reason may be because people may have, uh, their names may be stated that they have an account in Panama, they have an account in Cayman Islands, or they have an account in Mauritius. And they are siphoning money there, but that money could. But, but would you could say that follow. such such uh, an investigative report is a step in the right direction, perhaps? It is. It is whistleblowing, but I want us to understand that whistleblowing may throw light on other things other than corruption. So it could be wasteful, wasteful spending. So, for example, if your government takes a decision to buy, um, let's say, G wagons for police officers, that could be flagged as wasteful spending, but it's not necessarily corruption, particularly if the government through, goes through the necessary processes and approvals leading to that decision. So I may sit down and say, what? You're buying you are gone for all teachers and police officers? But it is not corrupt. It is just wasteful. So Panama Papers, for example, does not draw that distinction. It identifies everything and blows whistle on them. It is now left for all the countries to peel off what they can do with it. So, for example, in Kenya, it will say Uhuru Kenyatta has 305 accounts. But Uhuru, Uhuru Kenyatta and his family have business. 
And some of it, and well, as far as I know, a lot of it is legitimate business. So it is not wrong for legitimate businesses to have accounts. It's a question now whether those accounts are corrupt. Are they, for example, engaging in conflict of interest to make money to send there? So these are the kinds of questions that institutions have to deal with. But it is actually a right, the, the right thing to do. Whistleblowing of any kind is good for public sector, for development. And it helps in the, in the, in the governance system because leaders have to look over their shoulders because they know that people are watching. I guess we should welcome back uh, Dr. Tunji Oguyemi. The network took him up for a bit. Uh, good to see you again. Uh, let's just um, let's flip to the beginning of this conversation so we, we can actually get your perspective on where we are when it comes to the corruption fight in West Africa. Um, I was trying to get that from you before the uh, network took you off. Yes. Um, corruption um, is actually the Achilles heel of Africa's development enterprise. And there is no part of West Africa uh, that is free from that Achilles heels. Actually, none. Um, 16 countries in West Africa, yes. Is there anyone where corruption is not a major issue, uh, a major club in the wheel of progress? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The problem is that we actually need to conceptualize corruption uh, more than the presence of uh, taking or self enrichment by way of taking directly uh, public resources for personal gains. Corruption is actually devaluing the, the due process. If you devalue the due process, even though you have not materially enriched yourself with public funds, you are corrupt. For example, corruption in the judiciary by deliberately taking steps in the judicial process, especially in the administration of criminal justice, such that the laws and the procedures of a country is ridiculed, is not followed, is corruption. In fact, corruption is the devaluation of the due process of doing anything at all. So if we go by, say, uh, a narrow definition of corruption in terms of material enrichment, um, it will apply to every part of West Africa. And there is no country out of the 16 that are there that is free of this uh, menace. Okay, let, let's see if we can uh, beam some positive light here. The corruption perception index has seen some West African countries rise. I mean, they are not down below as they used uh, to be. Which of them would you say uh, is doing quite well? Stay with you, uh, Dr. Wiemi. Uh, it, it may be the perspective about which is doing well in the trajectory of evil uh, may be very difficult to give. But we, I mean, corruption is actually evil. It's evil uh, because it devalues the system, it devalues the process, it ridicules the value system, and it enriches the few and then impoverishes the majority. So if we begin to um, allocate maybe a pass mark in the trajectory of what is evil and say, this one is less evil than the other, uh, that may be very difficult. But you know, in terms of general survey, evidence has shown that uh, since um, Yaya Jame, for example, left um, the Gambia, the country has become less corrupt. And we can also say for sure that corruption uh, tend to be uh, reducing significantly, um, or not significantly, but reducing in Senegal. And it is not that uh, very terrible in countries like Sierra Leone and La Cote d'Ivoire. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, I was thinking you were going to say nothing, absolutely nothing is happening. Uh, I want to ask you the same question, uh, uh, Mr. Kaifala. Uh, do you think that there are countries in West Africa that are making quite an effort uh, from the, the data we have from the Perception Index? Oh, yes, indeed. I am sitting in one right now. A pro barometer <laughs> in 2015 survey showed that Sierra Leone was 70%. Corruption prevalence was 70%. Since I became commissioner in 2018, we've taken conscientious steps to reduce that. And uh, the survey that came out in 2020 confirmed that corruption prevalence has reduced 
from 70% to 40%. Also, MCC control of corruption scorecard, Sierra Leone was failing at 49% in 2018. In four years, we moved to 71%. We then moved to 79%. We moved to 73%. And today, to 83%, 81%, today we are sitting at 83%. Also in Transparency International Corruption Perception Index, Sierra Leone has moved 15 places in the last three years alone. In 2019 alone, we jumped 10 places in one go. And we have been above the sub-Saharan sub average since. Um, so, speaking for myself, I can confirm that a lot is being done in Sierra Leone, and uh, he rightly said that, yes, there is some movement in that, that direction, but there are other countries, like he rightly also mentioned, Senegal is one of them, where you can see that they keep, they keep doing consistently well. I do not know about Ivory Coast, because Ivory Coast has been declining in recent times, Ghana has been declining in recent times, Nigeria has been seriously declining in recent times. But also we have to understand this. These perception surveys are not always the, the, the best ways to determine whether there is effort against corruption in a particular country. I'll because as we know, perception is deeper. And the people, people it, it depends on how the people are. In a country where people are almost hungry all the time, if you ask them what is happening, they will always blame corruption for it. Even I when was the really economy hoping you were going to say that. And, so, and just to, yeah. <laughs> yes, I was hoping you were going to say that because when we talk about this uh, corruption um, index, many governments tend to you know, put it as uh, the clear indication that all is going pretty well. So in concrete terms then, if we're not to go with only the perception, what would you say, let's start with your country, is doing differently that others can maybe copy something to start off there? I think... I think African countries have to invest in prevention. Uh, the English say an ounce of prevention is better than tons of remedy. I think we do not invest much in prevention. Uh, most of the countries, particularly English speaking Africa, we like to focus on enforcement. It's a fire brigade kind of fighting corruption where you bring the ambulances when they, the house is already on fire. Prevention is better than cure, so you, dis you, you deploy your fire extinguishers in every corner. You make sure that you remove the opportunities for corruption. You reduce monopoly of decision-making in the public se se sector. You also make sure that you reduce the incentives for corruption, and you also remove opportunities for corruption. So really, where the countries that are doing very well are doing very well, not really because they are enforcing. Nigeria is enforcing more than any other country in Africa. That I know. Nigeria, when it comes to enforcement, Nigeria is the best example of enforcement. The EFCC is doing great at enforcement. But yet, in the MCC corruption, um, MCC corruption scorecard, Nigeria scored zero. Nigeria, like most other African countries, including my country, we have to continue investing in prevention measures and that is where we are lacking. But also public education is very important. There are certain countries where the anti graft institutions don't engage the public much. They are most times just holding back. They, they don't really believe, like any police institution, they think that their job is like the police officer. It is not. You have to engage the public. You have to engage and, okay. and educate the masses on the evils of corruption and recruit their support to fight corruption. If you do not have the masses behind you, you are wasting your time. So these are all things that need to be done. And of course, that is those are some of the things we are doing in Sierra Leone differently that other countries may try to okay. look at. Um, Professor Guiami, I want to pick up something that uh, Mr. Kaifala uh, just mentioned about the perception uh, about the corruption in Nigeria. You are from Nigeria. The perception seems to be that a lot is not, something is being done, but still not enough, right? But the... the Mr. Kaifala has a different opinion that a lot is being done in Nigeria's anti-corruption fight. Before I go to the next question, I want to ask you, do you agree that something is being done as well in Nigeria well enough for commendation or there are still a lot of loopholes that needs to be filled before we can begin to say Nigeria is comparatively um, making an effort? Um, there is no doubt that Nigeria is um, an anti-corruption enforcing country. No doubt about it. We have three, in fact, four in, uh, institutions that are enforcing anti-corruption procedures in Nigeria. Number one 
is the independent corrupt another um, offenses uh, commission, okay. independent corrupt practices another um, related offenses commission. Yeah. We have the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC. We have the Code of Conduct Bureau, and we have the Nigerian Financial, In Financial Intelligence Unit. These four institutions are fundamental uh, to Nigeria's fight against corruption. But if you look at perception, uh, anywhere you, you may wish to say it, perception is different from reality. That's actually the truth. Uh, to perceive a country to be less corrupt than the other does not actually mean that that country is less corrupt in reality uh, than the other. Uh, what we actually have in Nigeria is that we have done significantly, uh, I would say we've gone very far, I may not say significantly well, but very far in enforcing that corruption procedures. The reasons are, are clear why we cannot, why Nigeria cannot. Um, I think we've uh, lost Mr. Oguyemi again. Hopefully we can get him back. Um, I just realized uh, time is running <laughs> off for a month, so I'll just go to you um, Mr. Kaifala, uh, in, in a previous program, I did ask you about the independence of anti-corruption uh, bodies. I want to ask you that now um, to speak a little, maybe for about um, 40 seconds if you can. Should anti-corruption bodies be independent or depend on government intervention, especially where there are accusations in some parts of the sub-region that governments use these bodies as a witch hunt for political opponents? Firstly, I, I don't believe in total independence. I, I, I don't believe in complete independence of any anti graft institution. I think that the, the, the governing architecture is designed in such a way that none is independent. Uh, where we can say there is some there should be some degree of independence is functional independence, but administrative independence, no. The ICPC or the EFCC is not in a republic of its own. It is in the Republic of Nigeria, and it is subject to the same administrative architecture like all other institutions, including the financing structure. So it is not independent, and therefore, I am not somebody who likes to emphasize independence, but what is needed is that there is a framework for it to be to autonomously take decisions. For example, the president does not have to call the head to tell him who to be arrested, who should be prosecuted, who should be freed, or who should not. Similarly, the day-to-day -day activities of the institution should not be to the directions of the state house or such other ministerial institutions or bodies. And um, that is where really it gets difficult and interesting. Uh, in most cases, the perception is that they will never be independent, firstly because uh, the best practice is still for the president to appoint the head of the anti-corruption institution, or, and uh, sometimes it's subject to approval by parliament. And of course, he, like all other employees, are paid from state coffers. Okay. Um, therefore, I believe there should be independence, or rather, I would rather use the word autonomous, in that they can do their day-to-day -day activities without the interference of the state or institutions of the state or persons. But um, I, 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 I don't think so that they are complete completely, completely outside of the state apparatus. I okay. think that the decision-making and other activities may influence what they do from day to day. All right, we need to go on a break. But before we do that, I want to ask um, uh, Dr. Guiami quickly. Uh, there is something that was written by the current DG of the World Trade Organization, that's Ngozi Okonjo Iwala, back in 2019. She said she believes that it is indeed possible to fight corruption successfully with the right knowledge, patience, and commitment to transparency. Uh, there are two things there that, that sticks out for me, commitment and transparency. Do you share similar optimism? If yes, why? If no as well, why? Dr. Guyami, are you with us? I think we've lost him again. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll hold on to that question. Uh, hopefully we can get him up in the next part of this conversation. But let me come back to you, um, Mr. Kaifala. What would you see in the future with the current efforts to fight corruption in West Africa? What future do you see? Do you see um, one that we have um, gotten to a level of you know, celebration of the fight against corruption, or you think that it's an impossible fight to win? 
No, I think that in fact, I'm very hopeful. The data, the data seems to suggest that there a lot is being done in various countries. Um, almost every country in West Africa has an established anti-graft institution with responsibility to fight corruption. And the work they are doing, for example, prostitution has improved right across the continent, the subcontinent. Um, also, um, um, prevention work, public education work, anti-corruption issues has take, have taken center stage in public discourse and education. I think that we are heading in the right direction. Corruption has also become less fashionable. I don't think anybody would disagree that the way corruption was fashionable in the 60s, 70s, and even 80s and early 90s are the same way now. Today, if a person is told that he's corrupt, 10 chances to one, he will be embarrassed about it, and his family will not like to, to hear it. Of course, the mosque he goes or the church he goes will view him with some form of indignation, quite apart from the consequences that are taking place right across West Africa. So I am very hopeful that we are heading in the right direction. Uh, it takes time for cultures to change, particularly entrenched cultures like corruption culture, but it is not a mission impossible. It is definitely right. a mission possible. All right, let's see if we can uh, have uh, Dr. Oguyemi. Sal, can you hear me? Dr. Oguyemi, can you hear me? Okay, the network is not being quite friendly today. Uh, we're glad that the network from uh, Mr. Kaifala's end is still uh, good enough. Um, let me, let me come to the question about um, the growing role of citizens in the fight against corruption. My very first question, I, I sort of went around the trajectory of corruption growing towards the people, imbibing it almost as a way of life. So what I would like you to speak on is what needs to shift? How can we begin to get the people a little more involved in the fight against corruption? If you can do that in 30 seconds, so we can actually go on a break. I think the recruiting the people needs to see that we are serious about what we do. It's a question of, 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 of having a confidence in the institutions and the persons who are fighting corruption. So what has to change is to show that there is no secret cow. The rules apply to everybody. That is the most important thing to the people. The day they start seeing that it is not a situation of animal farm, where some are more favored than others, they will join the fight against corruption. They will support it en masse. But as long as they continue to be cynical about what we are doing with the fight against corruption, then of course we only have a fraction of them supporting what we do, if at all. All right, when we return from this very short break, we will attempt to review efforts at fighting corruption across the Sub-Saharan region, the impact of conflict, and hopefully expand on some of the lessons that can be taken and applied going forward in the fight in West Africa. Do stay with us. Mali, Burkina Faso, Guinea-Bissau, Guinea have all faced coups or attempts in the last two years. All these countries are battling deep corruption challenges. Inadequate resources to anti-graft agencies and weak judiciaries haven't helped the fight against corruption either. Asset tracking and recovery of stolen funds have been methods used to discourage others who may desire to steal. The lack of political will by leaders is also a foremost challenge, as political leaders are often the biggest names found in the act. 
What about the lack of inclusion seen in many societies and a culture of corruption that is leading to the emergence of criminals and anti-state agents? In a fight to read West Africa of corruption, a bottom-up, top-to-bottom, consistent culture of impunity must be eradicated. But the question is, by who? I still have my guests. Hopefully, Tunji Oguyemi is still with us and Francis Ben Kaifala. Thanks for staying with us. Thank you, Felicity. Okay, I guess I still have uh, just uh, Mr. Kaifala, so I'll just go ahead. Political instability, like you mentioned, seen in Mali, Guinea, and others have affected the fight against corruption, and many believe this even fuels it. Can corruption fights still be productive in conflict or politically unstable environment? I think that the corruption is a function of a, of a I mean, corruption is a, is a function of bad governance. So um, they are interrelated in such a way that if you do not have a stable governance architecture with, the fun with proper functioning institutions, headed by level-headed people, a critical mass of people who have the vision, the courage, and the ability to move things forward, of course you, you will not be able to produce the results that you need. So the military believe in using the barrel of the gun to change things. But anybody who uses the barrel of the gun is usually himself not subject to, to the same scrutiny. So there is nobody to guard the guardian. Um, I don't believe that in a country where there is country, there, there is strife, there is democratic, democratic um, um, there is no proper democratic system. I don't believe that they even have the foundation to fight corruption. Uh, I think that for a country to succeed in the fight against corruption, such benchmarks have to be there. And one of them is that a stable governance system, which is accountable to the people and is ready to eradicate impunity. But a man who holds the gun himself is likely not to be subject to any form of punishment. So it is the man who is subject to impunity that is basically, so it is ruled by the gun and is ruled by the law. It is not rule of law. And for corruption to be fought, there has to be rule of law, not ruled by law. Let, let's look at the other part of the region, actually. Earlier, I asked you what countries in uh, West Africa you feel are doing um, somewhat uh, well in the fight against corruption. And you mentioned uh, your country, Senegal, and uh, Dr. Guillaume, um, Dr. Guillaume, you also mentioned some. Now I want to ask you, what has been done in other parts of the world that you think can be adopted um, in West Africa in a fight against corruption? What examples can you pick from other parts of the world that has worked that we can apply in the sub-region? Look at best practices, even in Africa, you have to look at countries like Rwanda, you have to look at countries like Mauritius, Seychelles, you have to look at Cape Verde. Those are the leaders, not even the ones that we had called earlier. The ones that we had called earlier are merely doing a lot to come up. But the ones who are already up there are the ones that I have called. Okay. Now, in the world itself, of course, we have other advanced democracies where a lot is being done to fight corruption. The Scandinavian countries, for example, are one of the most stable places in the world and they are less corrupt than most other parts of the world. And one thing they are doing very well is prevention. I have told you, without prevention, we are wasting our time. And prevention is not cheap. Governments have to be ready to invest in prevention. Those machines you see when you go to the airports, those machines you see when you go in other countries where payments are made, when you reduce a country's payment system from cash-based to cashless system, where you don't have much interaction between people and money, cash money, you would have reduced corruption by over 50%. But where payments are still manual, where somebody has to stand and pay to a cashier who has to count and put in his pocket, where people have monopoly over decision making and you don't have it diversified in such a way that one person cannot have an overall control over everything, of course, you will be able to see that uh, reducing corruption in those countries will be difficult. So those countries, for example, Georgia, reduce corruption by investing in prevention. We in Africa don't like investing in prevention. In my country, 
I have been saying this for years. Prevention, prevention, prevention. Spend money on prevention. Make sure that receipt systems are made. There are softwares, there are machines, there are systems that are there. They are not cheap, but when you put them in place, you make more. They are not willing. We like to build bridges. We like to build roads. We like to do things, but sometimes the money to do those things are not there because somebody is stealing them somewhere. Therefore, I can say this any day to Africa. The day we take investment in prevention seriously, that will be the day any country will be ready to fight corruption in that country. Because prevention sets systems that leaves audit trails. So even at catching somebody who steals is easier because there will be audit trails. There will be banking systems. You can track payments. You can go after them easily. And of course, impunity will be reduced because it is easy to know who did what, when, why. But today we are here talking about fighting corruption and we are not willing to invest in prevention. And that is where we are getting it wrong. We okay. have to invest in, in prevention. prevention. Okay, aside prevention, we know that getting those who are caught in the act and punishing them appropriately uh, will also serve as deterrence to others that uh, you know are found that uh, might have that mindset to do um, get into a corrupt act. I, I would want to ask, however, where you have a system um, where you have plea bargains, people that are found to be corrupt um, going to plea bargains with government and their sentences are reduced. Um, is that progressive in the fight against corruption, or that takes us back a mile? No, it doesn't really take us back in my. I mean, I, I, I mean that is one of the things because we, Africa, for some reason, we believe too much in the judiciary. We believe that all rules do lead to courts, and the courts should punish. Uh, but sometimes that has not. I mean, not even sometimes that has not really worked well for us. The judiciary is a problem. Some countries are better than others, but more generally, we can say that we are all facing challenges with the judiciary. Therefore, I am one person who does not believe that all roads should lead to the courts. There have to be systems that can redress issues without necessarily having to go to court. And that is where things like settlement come in. For example, in Sierra Leone, the anti-graft agency had been in existence for 18 years before I became commissioner. All the recoveries they had done in those years combined was not more than $2 million combined for 18 years. In two years, what we did with settlements and recovery from the corrupt is more than, it was more than $3 million. Well, in some it's cases, going let, me, let me just interrupt here. In, in some cases, we know that even these uh, settlements, for instance, in Nigeria, I'm just giving an instance, somebody might have stolen a billion uh, naira, and then the person is willing to give back maybe some millions to the government in exchange for lesser punishment does that really serve as a deterrent for somebody who knows that, I mean, if I steal 20 billion, I can give the government 10 billion and keep another 10 billion for myself. So well, it's enough impact. No, a settlement because. system. I'm trying to make what it very ordinary. What I can tell you, what we have done in Sierra Leone is where a settlement system, first of all, the formula to read a country of corruption is to make it expensive and non-profitable. Okay, so it has to be a high risk and a low return venture in economic terms. So any action that does not lead to corruption being a high risk and a low return venture is not a good, good move. Because of course, engaging in corruption is an economic decision. Somebody has to decide on a normal demand and supply rule that he's ready to pay if he's caught for corruption. And you can only make sure that less people engage in corruption when you make that price expensive. Now, in Sierra Leone, what we have done is to make sure that anybody who is found, who engages in settlement for corruption, has to pay back the full amount that is discovered to have been misappropriated. One. Two, that person will not hold public office for a period not less than three years. It could be 15, 20, 30 years. It depends on the negotiation with the anti graft institution. Four, you also have to pay 10% for every year completed that that corrupt money was misappropriated by you. So that is the formula that we use to enter into settlements. So it's not a free for all open negotiation like you are making it now, but I know that there are certain other countries where these things happen. 
It's a simply, it's a simple situation where they have to correct their formula to make sure that corruption or whatsoever punishment they impose makes corruption non-profitable and expensive. Wow. So uh, that is what they have to do. Well, let, let's hope we we'll see that more than, uh, you know, this uh, seemingly light sentences that people say is just a slap on the wrist. Uh, the, the status quo um, continues as such. Um, I want, let me see if we could uh, take just, in... Just to correct that, I mean, most of these settlement things that they are doing are actually the best practices within the anti graft world. The UNODC, under which all of us operate, sanctions it. So you have to use civil processes in addition to the criminal processes. It is the courts that have to impose higher punishments when somebody has been tried and convicted. It is them to give custodial sentence. For example, in my country, we are battling with the courts ordering custodial sentence. We are telling them you have to send people to 15 years imprisonment, 20 years imprisonment, but they are not willing to do so. So these are all issues that we are battling with. And it is more, I mean, it's different from country to country, but some are more similar than others. You've mentioned the, the judiciary quite a number of times in, in the course of this conversation. I, I, want, I don't want to ask how they are impeding the fight against corruption. I want to ask, in your view, how can they uh, begin to work towards restoring some faith in the credibility of the courts to help the anti-corruption fight make some real progress as against being a stumbling block? I mean, the judiciary really needs to understand that they are they are playing a very important role in reading society of a serious malaise. They are ready to impose very serious punishments for murder. But corruption is killing people en masse. So they have to be ready, first of all, to take the cases seriously and to impose punishments that are reflective of the offenses that are being committed against the people of the respective countries of West Africa. And that is where we have to continue holding them accountable. In Sierra Leone, what we did was to set up a special division of the High Court, and we properly vet the judges that sit in there, and of course, hold them accountable for the decisions they make. Um, that could help. It is difficult dealing with the judiciary because of the independence, particularly the normative independence that is guaranteed in the Constitution. They are not subject to the directive of any other person, but also they have to understand that they have a sacred role to play. And um, generally in Africa, the people are disappointed. You talked as well about the preventive uh, measures as against, you know, trying to heal the problem. You talked about putting steps in place. What are some of these preventive measures that you think, uh, maybe that you've done in yours, that you think other African countries can emulate um, to help the fight? I mean, th there is no country that is doing more what we call corruption risk assessment than Nigeria, for example. When it comes to public sector corruption risk assessment, the ICPC in Nigeria is the best example in the entire Africa. That is something we in Sierra Leone have copied. And we are doing a lot of systems and processes reviews that aim towards identifying monopolies, identifying incentives of corruption, identifying opportunities for corruption, identifying concentrations of power and dissecting them and giving recommendations that could be solved to ensure that this public sector is less corrupt. Those are the things that need to be done in Africa. Also, and most importantly, we have to invest in prevention. Like I have said, I cannot over, I cannot, I will never stop emphasizing this. Prevention is not cheap. We have to buy the right system. This is the 21st century. There are, there are, there are, there are software, there are machines, there are, there are systems, there are, there are, there are expertise which can be deployed in the system and it will automatically reduce corruption by over 50%. If we do that, they will be fine. Lastly, and most importantly, we have to make sure we punish those who are caught well and fairly. Yes, they are entitled to fair trial. We give them fair trial. But when, at the end of the day, it is found out that indeed the charges against them are upheld, they should face the music without any sacred cow. I think those are the kinds of things because that will be the deterrent effect. If we can have a system that deters corruption, it is easier for us to move forward. Fair enough. As we sort of wrap up, I think we have uh, Dr. Guiami. Let's just try one last time. Dr. Guiami, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay. Perfect. The, the, the network has been crazy and we're almost wrapping up. But I, I'd like to um, take you back to what you were saying earlier about the, I, I'm not sure now if it is the independence of the 
um, anti-corruption agencies, or you were talking more about the role of the judiciary? Actually, I was talking about the name. It's actually, we have an independent corrupt practice, another uh, related offenses commission. That, that's, institutions, that's yes, that's institutions that fight but corruption the organization. In Africa. Okay, if you, if you can just wrap charged. up that thought in 30 yeah, seconds, yeah. so I can chip in one more question before we go. All right, I, I, I think that what Nigeria needs to do now is to strengthen the code of conduct bureau. The conduct bureau, bureau is the institution that is charged with the responsibility of preventing corruption in Nigeria. And it is a much stronger uh, organization uh, if allowed to operate politically uh, because it is established by the constitution. So let's strengthen the code of conduct bureau and permit the director or the executive secretary of code of conduct bureau uh, to do the needful. I'm going to ask you this question and, and also put it to uh, Mr. Kaifala as well. And that's the role of the media. Earlier, we talked about the role of the people. I mean, there seems to be a trajectory where people are beginning to imbibe a culture of a corruption like it is um, a normal thing, really. It has escal escalated in recent years. So I want to ask, um, what role can the media play in this instance? Some people are a bit... Um, um, skeptical sitting down to watch programs like this. So in what other ways can the media encourage people to understand that whatever role they play that negatively affects the anti-corruption fight affects them personally in the long run? Means let the Nigerian media, in fact the African media, expose corruption by all means. Yes, we are mindful of the law against libel and slander, if you like, defamation. But with the Nigerian uh, Freedom of Information Act, it is perfectly possible to expose corruption without any negative backlash. The truth of the matter is that the media, in, the truth of it is that the media is the fourth um, estate of the realm. And it's high time it began doing that uh, more aggressively within the context of the African uh, development. All right, I'll, I'll come back. I'll wrap up with you. Hopefully the network will hold. But I want to put that same question to you, uh, Mr. Kaifala. The media, their, their coverage the so estate, far, what can the media, they do better? The, the media that is so-called the fourth estate has power. Um, that power has to be deployed to tackle one of the greatest malaises that is affecting countries. They need to have the courage to take issues on. They need to have the courage to bring it forward, and they should do so despite the odds against them because the media is power. Uh, I believe that a lot is being done, but it could do more. Um, we have a country, for example, in Sierra Leone, if, if you invite the media to anti-corruption issues and you don't pay money to them, to, they will not even broadcast the news sometimes. Not all of them, but most of them. So these are things that we have to battle for the media to understand that they have an important role to do and it should not be monetized. They should do it with courage. They should do so with responsibility. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kaifala, for speaking with us. Uh, unfortunately, I can put my last question to you, uh, Mr. Guiami. Uh, I'm told that we're out of time. So I want to just thank you both very warmly uh, for giving us your time tonight. Thank you. Indeed, Africa needs to focus its anti-corruption fight on long-term high return institution building activities, preventive measures, coupled with the justice infrastructure and political will to hold those who transgress accountable. Thank you very much for watching and bye for now.